from The Selfish Path to Romance. Download Chapter 1 for free at drkenner.com. I know, it's me. I'm, I'm going through some changes. Well, welcome to the world. <laughs> Things happen. Don't you think I'm going through a lot? Not like me. Oh, what? So now you're special? You're a special boy. You know, you may have some friends or family members who are serving in the military or who are over in Iraq or Afghanistan or who are even in maybe a different country. And what are the issues that face them? What are the concerns that they have? What are the themes that they have? And when they come home, what are the issues that are facing them then? With me today, I have Jay White. I heard him at a conference How Will We Welcome Them Home, a conference on post-traumatic stress disorder and helping vets come home and make life easier for them. And he is a readjustment counselor at the Hartford Veterans Center. And I want to welcome you to the show today, Jay. Thank you. Jay, you you want to talk a little bit about some of the concerns that the vets have. What are the common issues that you see a lot of the vets facing? Well, I tell a lot of them that I wish that they could sit in here and listen to everybody else because, um, you know, many times they come in here and they feel like they're, the, the, they're alone and, and they're the only one with problems. But um, I, I think the biggest thing we see is, is people who aren't sleeping very well, and then right matching that would be anger issues. Off the top of my head, those are the two biggest problems that are facing the guys. Of course, you could argue that the lack of sleep would cause the irritability, which causes the anger. Well, it makes um, it worse, certainly. Yeah. But anger, anger is an emotion that says that there is an injustice that has been done. Why would you think so many of them are feeling anger? Where is the injustice in their personal lives? What have you heard? Well, during our group sessions that we have with uh, Beth, we talk about this, and a lot of times we discuss how we feel that when we're over there, there are a lot of times where you are fearful. And for even the National Guard and Reserve people over there who are a lot of times support element, mm-hmm. um, and this this isn't exclusive to them, this, this, uh, to them, this goes to everybody. But uh, you are fearful over there because anything could happen at any time. So that constant fear, you realize that you need to, right away, one of the first things you realize once you're in country is you've got to get rid of that fear. Mm-hmm. You have to, it's going to be there but you've got to suppress it. Mm -hmm. And I think, and we think when we talk, uh, that just that suppressed fear is now starting to come back and and leak out in different ways uh, once the the people are able to come home uh, and try to settle down. And something will remind them of of whatever, you know, a fearful time, or, or they'll smell something, they'll feel a muscle tension in something, and it reminds them of the time, how how they felt scared and whatnot, and I think a lot of that comes out, and when it comes out, it comes out in the form of anger. Yeah, and that's interesting that it comes out as anger, because if you look at post-traumatic stress disorder, a lot of it is that they don't want to relive that. They survived in, let's say, when I worked with the vets, it was the Vietnam vets and the the other wars, and you you have to train your mind, if I'm hearing you correctly, in survival mode, not to focus on how afraid you are, but to suppress that fear. Absolutely. Uh, you, you, you notice right away that you're scared, and you know that you've learned in the past that anytime you're scared, you don't perform as well, and God knows that's the time to not perform well, and by that I mean to not think on your feet and be able to get safe. To do, to do the safest thing, to uh, get out of a situation that you might need to get out of or help someone else to get out of a situation. You've got to be able to think clearly, and if you let fear distract you, uh, it's dangerous. So you learn, I think it's instinctively, you just learn to put the fear on the back burner, and then when you come home, it seems to somehow creep its way to the front burner. Then, okay, because it doesn't go away. It doesn't, your mind just doesn't erase it as if it didn't happen. So you've trained your mind to numb, to avoid thinking of your fear. I suppose that would be how you could describe it. And then in your own personal experiences, what happened when you came home? Because you fought in Baghdad. You fought whereabouts? I was in Baghdad, right. In the Um, National Guard. Right, yeah. I was... Uh, with the 83rd we're Army Reserve Unit, and we yeah. we got a team of us, uh, were uh, several teams of us were uh, sent forth, 82nd or with the 3rd ID. I was with the 3rd ID with just a team of four, so uh, they were in Baghdad, and that's where I was with them. 
And when you came home, how did that suppressed fear start leaking out? What did you observe in yourself that you, you're saying is normal? A lot of vets have said this in group therapy or privately to you. Anger was, was a big issue for me. Uh, of course, the nightmares, they did start to go away after a little while, but they definitely made you believe you were there. Very scary, you know. Very and vivid. Very vivid and just hyper alertness. Um, you hear a bang, even still you hear a, a bang. It doesn't sound like it used to, mm-hmm. um, especially if you know, like, for instance, everyone mentions fireworks. Fireworks, right. Or a, you know they're going to pop off, that's one thing. If you don't see them, then they pop off. Right. We had a truck backing up at the VA, and I was in a group with vets, and boy, you should have seen that tr- startle response. You know how it backfires or backs up? Yeah. And can, and it, it was just instantaneous with all of them, and I'm sitting there perfectly relaxed because I haven't served in a war, and to me it was just a truck making noise. Yeah, and I'm sure there's probably... Many people who've been in car accidents here who've been to war, but they've had traumatic experiences. It's they not could... that much different, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the certain smells, I mean, smells, they say, are uh, something that can bring you back fastest, you know. Yeah, that's interesting. It, with the Vietnam non vets that I worked with, when they said when they went on a golf course and they smelt the mustiness, yeah. it brought them right back to the jungles, and the family couldn't understand it because here they are on a lovely Saturday afternoon playing golf, and they're totally traumatized. You know, it's a, right. it's a different experience for them than for everyone else. You're a readjustment counselor. What advice would you want to give to the vets? You know, you're the one that you're hearing that they're isolating, they're not sleeping well, they've got a lot of anger. What type of advice would you want to give them, for, especially for the vets who are afraid to get help? Uh, well, that's what I would have said is to get help, but... Um, no, you can. It, that's okay. I, I think that they need to give themselves a break. And one, it's ironic because you learn in the military that everything is teamwork. That's the first thing anyone learns, right, from boot camp, basic training, wherever you go. Uh, you learn right away everything is teamwork. But it's pretty ironic how you come home and now you have to handle this. And uh, it, the Vietnam vets and the Korean and World War II vets have proven that this stuff doesn't go away right away. Mm-hmm. So we need to look at what they've done. Let's learn from their mistakes. As veterans, looking at these other veterans, some of those guys needed to get help right away. So what, we shouldn't belittle whatever we did over there. And, uh, you know, a lot of the vets are so proud they think that, uh, oh, well, what I did wasn't compared to what somebody in Vietnam did or, you know, guys in Vietnam probably didn't compare to World War II and vice versa, whatever. Yeah. And they need to stop doing that and say, listen, I do need help. I, I can't do this alone. And I, it, get help wherever you can, if it's at a hospital or the vet center. You know, Just to that. be able to talk through your trauma. Yeah. Okay, I'm with Jay White today. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you're someone who's struggling very personally with this and you want to find new coping strategies for yourself or you want to be able to identify the trouble signs within yourself early, go ahead, go to the vet center and see if you can speak to someone such as Jay White. Jay White's a readjustment counselor who can help you uh, help you put your life back on track. Thank you so much for being with us today, Jay. Thank you. And I did a lot of family therapy with vets, uh, and I just noticed it, it takes its toll on even the littlest ones in the family when dad pulls back or when dad's got unexplainable anger. So if it's dad or mom in this case, go get yourself some help. It's good for you. It's good for your own dignity, and it's certainly good for those you love. I'm Dr. Ellen Kenner, and you're listening to the rational basis of happiness and I love being with you and I look forward to being with you again next week my number if you want to jot it down is toll free 1-877-DR-K-E-N-N-E-R that's 1-877-DR-KENNER and my website's drkenner.com call 911 she's on the run if you're all alone pick up the phone and call Here's an excerpt from The Selfish Path to Romance, the serious romance guidebook by clinical psychologists Dr. Kenner and Locke. Sally left Wayne a curt Dear John note. 
Wayne was crushed. He had idolized her. As he thought about it more, however, he realized that he had never felt at home with her or loved by her. Behind Sally's good looks, there was no real self. She was a narcissist who used Wayne to get money and attention, but she never showed a personal interest in him. Clearly, he should have gotten to know her as a real individual. Intoxicated by her beauty, he gave her an unlimited benefit of the doubt about everything else. Even when we keenly observe and accurately evaluate a potential partner's behavior, a person may be adept at temporarily camouflaging bad character traits. You can download Chapter 1 for free by going to drkenner.com and you can buy the book at amazon.com.